Um, so what we have is the keynote for today's lunch is Mark Cherangelo. He is the chairman of SNG Space Systems Group, as well as corporate VP of, S of Sierra Nevada. So the Space Systems Group, of which Mark is um, well leading, um, as Mark told you guys about at the last panel, for those of you guys who saw that, um, is responsible for a great number of missions and components, over 400 missions, over 4,000 components that SSG has created components for. Um, he's also working on the Dream Chaser program, which I'm sure Mark will be telling you guys about here. Um, he's also the chairman of the Commercial Space, Commercial Space Flight Federation and has been pioneering this new space concept through Dream Chaser and through Space Dev and a lot of his previous work. And I'm sure that will come up in what he's saying here as well. So what he's going to be talking about here is um, where we are right now, kind of a report card as to you know, commercial space flight. And with that, we'll go ahead and pass it on to Mark. Hi there. No, you're not feeling deja vu. Uh, I wanted to first start and, and say thank you to Ryan um, for managing this conference. We, we know uh, those of us who've been involved in these, these kinds of things know how difficult it is. And uh, Ryan has it even more difficult because since he uh, decided to take this on, he's now working for me uh, in Sierra Nevada. So we know what he's doing during the day. And he can't seem to fit it in. So all this work that he's done has really been outside of this, and uh, it's really been a terrific conference. So thank you, Ryan, and the whole team for what you guys have done. Uh, I was asked to talk a little while ago, and, and I do a lot of speaking, and I sort of planned out what I was going to say. And a few days ago, uh, over the last week or so, it, it sort of changed a lot for me. So I'm going to be doing something a little bit different than what is in the, uh, the presentation guide, and just using this sort of rare opportunity to talk a little bit from the heart about where we are in the space industry, where I think we are in terms of the, the future of space, a little bit of how we got here, and, and a, a number of people have sort of asked for a bit of a history of how does this whole commercial endeavor uh, really begin and where is it, and to the best I can, I'm going to at least give you one person's viewpoint from all that, but uh, you know, sometimes in life you have to stop and take a, a look at where you are and all the technology and all the other things that all the great speakers will be talking about. I'm actually not going to be speaking much about any of our programs. I think there are other times to do that. I'm going to talk about really our life in space and I'd like to uh, perhaps start that with something that I wanted to recognize and uh, we, uh, we lost a, a really terrific person this past week and um, I wanted to just acknowledge that, that loss for, for a number of reasons. Uh, not only was, uh, was Sally a, a major part of our industry, but she was a very unique person. And I, I can't speak to being a long-term personal friend. There are many people who, who may be in the room who are, but I've had the chance to encounter her on a number of occasions. And you know, what, was, what I found was wonderful, and I just wanted to spend a moment and acknowledge her presence in our life and, and others uh, and, and uh, the, f the impact that she's had on our industry. She uh, was part of the, uh, of the Augustine Commission, as you realize, and she spent a lot of time working on what, what the future of space might look like. But I think most importantly, she said something to me once that I have never forgotten, and I, I have not seen in print, so I'm going to put it in print, and that she, uh, as uh, those of you who know her, knew that she was a little bit uncomfortable with the idea of being the first woman in space, and it was really not what she was, uh, was all about. She embraced it later on as, as life went on and she had many opportunities I think to get involved at NASA and she chose to take a different path and the path of an educator is uh, someone who can inspire students and I always admired that. But she said to me once that you know beyond the the, the, the obvious uh, first that she was involved with that she was looking forward to a day where there wasn't any check boxes on the applications that we didn't determine who was going to move forward into these programs based on what they look like, what their race was, what their gender was, and it was just about what they were talented, how their talent was. And I thought that was really, for me, the most, uh, the most touching and uh, memorable moment that she said to me. And I think that's how she viewed her life, that her, her role was one of, of prominence in our space program, but was really, she was there because of who she was and, and her talent and the fact that she's passed it on to countless numbers of, of young people since then has really been an amazing thing. So Sally's not here with us, but if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to at least give her a round of applause. I, uh, 
I live in, in Colorado, in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, we have been in uh, the news a lot this past week, um, this past year actually. We've had major fires and over 400 homes have, had uh, been destroyed. And this past week we had a, a fairly amazing tragedy that we've all read about. And it's a, it's a bit of a personal uh, connection, and that's really what I want to spend a few minutes talking about. Uh, we, uh, I'm fortunate to employ some of the um, highest quality, most energetic space geeks in the country. And um, that, uh, that day, many of them have been planning to go out that evening to, to go out and see the um, opening of the Batman movie. So I, uh, it was one of those things that was a pretty normal occurrence and the, uh, well, many of my folks did go out and do that. So somewhere in the middle of the night I got a phone call that uh, war told me about what had happened. And we, at the time, we didn't know where or what theater, and I knew that there were many dozens of my, uh, my employees who were out at that midnight show somewhere within the 20 mile radius, uh, uh, fortunately not at this theater. But we didn't, uh, we didn't know that at the time. And it made me really realize, as, as I've been part of that whole experience and went to the, uh, went to the uh, uh, memorial service and got to spend some time with Governor Higginlooper, who's been managing this as, as well as anybody I think could, you know, what's really important in life. And I want to maybe speak, speak a little bit about that. And we, we hear a lot of bad news in the space industry. It's been a tough time. And I, some those of you know me know that I speak about optimism. I speak about the future. I speak about the good stuff. And we, we do what we do not because it's a job. We do what we do because we love it. And it's a passion. And I think people are in this industry because of that. Uh, it's, it's a rare thing in any industry. I, don't, I can't really remember when I have had somebody actually turn down a job to come into the space industry. Most people, we have hundreds of people lining up for those jobs. And, and I put this up here because one of the things uh, I like to talk about is how special it really is. And we, uh, we do things that a lot of people can't do. And one of the things that I get to do is to say things like this, that next Sunday I'm landing something on Mars. And uh, it's not something that you normally say in dinner conversation. And yeah, I think it just, for me, and there are many of you who are involved in these kinds of things, it makes us realize why, why it's so special, why we love what we've done. We've been fortunate to have visited seven planets, the sun, and have had hundreds of missions. But this one that's coming up, the MSL, is a, is a very special mission that I think has a lot of emotion for many of us. But you sit there and you look out. Uh, I live in the mountains and I get to look at Mars occasionally through a telescope and you say, I'm going to be landing something on that little dot here in a few days. It's a pretty amazing thing that we do and it's a passion for, for our industry. And um, one of my favorite songs, I, I think a lot about music and um, I wanted to talk about how did I get involved, particularly with the Dream Chaser program. And it and it's a, a song that, that I think some of you know, but it's Live Like You're Dying. And the whole atmosphere of what happened around Colorado, the, the idea of what happened with, uh, with Sally and how her life was cut short, and, and uh, it makes you really stop and realize that maybe what we should be thinking about is all those great things in life. Like the song says, that you can go skydiving or you can go climbing in the Rockies and really enjoy the moment that you do. And there are many people right now in this industry that I think are are looking at the future and saying, what do I want to do? Do I want to take a chance? Do I want to, to uh, change my life around? And I'll tell you a little bit about the history of how I got here and how we started doing our Dream Chaser program. It actually came up of, as a result of this kind of feeling. Um, I, was, uh, I, I had a, uh, a home in, and was working in New York City at the time of the 9-11 tragedy. I was shuttling back between Pasadena, Caltech, and New York City. And you have moments in your life where you stop and you realize that um, it could be very different. And I'm sure if you listen to the stories of the people who came out of the theater, how some people died, how some people lived, it's just an amazing thing. My own little personal story was that I was on um, the plane that was hijacked out of Boston that crashed, except I had the ticket for the day before. And I have the ticket in my, in my house that shows what I was going to be doing, and I actually had changed my flight. And I was flying back to California, and, and that flight was diverted and wound up uh, being part of that 9-11 tragedy. And I would moved my flight from the 11th to the 10th. So one of the things I kept keeping my little memento pile is, is that ticket that I have that, for me, I look back and I said, you know, just but for some chance, I got done early and I changed my flight and left the day early and was, flew back to California and, and um, had several friends of mine that were lost in that, in that situation. But it came to me that realized that maybe it would be time to start doing something that was very different. 
And I'd been growing up as a pilot, and I, and I spent a lot of time thinking about the future. And one of the things I thought about was I really wanted to be part of what I thought would be the next generation of space travel. And at that time, there wasn't a COTS program. There wasn't a commercial crew program. And uh, it, it was really a very nascent feeling, but it was a feeling that I had very deep inside, and I didn't really know how to go about doing that at the time. But as I went back and reflected after that tragedy, after the tragedies that have happened, I think people realize that these kinds of things are very important. And um, so I began a little bit of a journey to try to make that happen. And I want to sort of talk about the, the COTS program, the commercial crew program. And a lot of people write about how life is so different with it, and I, you know, is the world really upside down? It really isn't, in my view. I think it is a natural progression of how things have changed. And the, uh, the essence of this for us went back to uh, well into 2003, 2004. I, I found my way to a company called Space Dev and uh, became the chairman and CEO of that organization. And we began as a, a fairly unknown organization with about 30 or 40 people looking at saying, could we really build a orbital space plane? which was an audacious thing to think about when you had 30 or 40 people sitting in an, in an office. Uh, it really was sort of a, a pie in the sky kind of dream thing. But it was something that we felt passionate about and when you put a lot of really passionate people in a room and you lock the door and you fill it full of Red Bull and coffee, you never know what's gonna come out. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, we began that process and about the same time, I think there was a, a movement going on inside of NASA and some of us may forget where, where the origins of this program came from, but it was really under the administration of Mike Griffin and it was under the presidency of George Bush and it was under the leadership of a number of people in Congress, most notable uh, Senator Shelby, who helped formulate the original COTS program. And that program was uh, started and launched in, uh, in the early 2000s, now almost a decade ago with a fairly large award. The first one was a $500 million award for what was known. Uh, the government's known for a lot of acronyms. I've always um, thought that this one was one that should have been changed early on, but the idea of COTS, Commercial Orbital Transportation Services. Well, those of us in the space industry, COTS means commercial off the shelf. And um, you know the two names often get confused, but that was a really groundbreaking, pretty amazing thought process back then that uh, and many of you probably don't know it, but the rules of the game at that time were that big companies would not apply. That uh, the idea was to spur on a whole new set of companies in the United States who could do something different. And that's why many of us, at that time SpaceX, which was still a nascent company, us, uh, a, a number of others, all got together and there were over 26 companies that applied, most of which were uh, fledgling young companies. And the concept was, let's put some money into this really changing, audacious program that said we're going to spur on the industry. And if you think back, you know, we think this is groundbreaking now, but at the time it was, it was quite a big thing. And it was not $50 million, it was a $500 million award. And there were eventually going to be two or three awardees. So it was a pretty, pretty interesting thing. I, um, one of my favorite books that I, I tell people about is a book called Profiles in Audacity. And it's a really great book because it's got about well, 40 or 50 vignettes in it about uh, really important decisions that get made and from going back to the Romans to current day. And, and, th and this book basically says, let's go into the mind of the people making this decision. What was that decision? What really changed? How did it happen? And um, I don't know if any of you know this guy called James Lipton. He does uh, Inside the Actor Studio, which is a show about the, the entertainment industry primarily. But at the end of the show, he does a, a questionnaire. And his questionnaire goes back 100 years to a French uh, sociologist. And the, this French doctor went out and looked and he said, I'm going to ask the same 30 questions to thousands of people and I'm going to compile these answers. And Lipton picked this up and he asked the same questions to every guest at the end of the show. And one of the two questions he asks is, what sound or word do you hate? What sound or word do you love? He asks questions like, what job would you most not like to do in life? For me, it's coal miner. Um, but and then what job would you love to do? For me, it's going to fly a space vehicle. So, you, But uh, my favorite word and, and, I, and my favorite impression of, out of this is a, the word called audacious. And that's the book on audacity. And audacious to me means to really have that idea, to have a dream, to do something that's never been done before. To be able to look at something and say, you know, I can really do it. 
The other side of the word for me, the word I hate, is when people say it's impossible, that I can't do it. It'll never be done, and it'll never happen. And I can't tell you how many times in the last eight years that I've heard that word, that you'll never fly, you'll never get a program, it'll never go anywhere. And we're at the precipice of a decision that's going to be coming up here, and I don't know if we're going to win or not. Uh, we've, we've done a, a really good job of making it happen. But I do know it's sort of an interesting time because somewhere between now and the next few weeks that decisions will be made, thousands of people will be affected one way or the other. But really origins go back to a group of people and, and an agency in NASA that really doesn't get the credit it, it deserves for, for being audacious, for taking on something that's very different, for changing it. And when you read through this book, there's a whole bunch of vignettes and some, some are really interesting, some are funny. And, there are many stories of people that did this, and um, uh, many of you know the story of Florence Nightingale, or at least know the name. What you don't really know is probably that she was the first woman that was able to lead a medical facility and change the whole course of medical treatment. She was not anybody who was well known at the time, and there was things like that. One of my favorite, though, is um, terms is the decision to reshape reality. We are, uh, I think, in a, in a time where we are reshaping reality, and I don't know anyone know what that word means underneath? Uh, it's, a, it's a great story. Uh, many of us know the Galileo and the story of Galileo and, and Copernicus. Um, Galileo was someone who was a very brilliant guy, uh, obviously, but he had a lot of issues with the time he lived in. The time he lived in was, was uh, pretty rough on scientists and philosophers and people who wanted to be different. And uh, he was a smart man and he came up with some ideas and the church at the time said to him uh, who ran most of the world and or at least his world said you know you can't say that you can't say that the earth moves around the sun even though you may believe it and because we're gonna get really upset at that and maybe you won't have a head to be able to say that pretty soon so despite the fact that he had read all of Copernicus's stuff and he was very very important to him he realized that that was going to be a problem so he went quiet on it and then one night he woke up, as the story goes, in the middle of the night, and he looked out the window and he said these words, which means, but it moves. The earth moves. And he knew in his heart that he could not deal with something that was the reality, was the truth in his, in his mind. And I think in a lot of ways that's where we are in, in, in our industry. We have to make change. We have to realize that the earth is moving around us, and that change is happening. I think happening in a good way, in a positive way. We, uh, the, the story of the end of the story of Galileo was that he uh, was very creative in how he figured out how to get this out. He decided he liked his head, he didn't want it taken off. So he went back and he started writing a book in, late in his life. And all books had to be censored at that time. And they figured if he wrote a book that said, hey, uh, I disagree now and, I, and I'm going back to saying that the earth really does move around the sun, that wasn't going to be really good for his health. So what he did was he did two things that were important. He decided to write the book in Italian and not Latin. And people were wondering, well, that, the impression of the church or the people reviewing it was that means it wasn't really a serious book. And then what he did was he wrote what he, in the foreword that this was really a hypothetical th book, that it was really fiction, but he, but he thought it was important fiction. And what that meant was, uh, and it was sort of surprising, was instead of just uh, a few thousand people who knew Latin and could read books, by putting it into the common language of Italian at the time, it went all over the, the countryside and everybody could read it. And uh, the, uh, the view that he had when he died was in fact he was able to, to make that change. Well, Galileo just came in and decided I was done with my speech, I think. So we're going to move on. <laughs> the, uh, I, I wanted just to, to talk a little bit more about that. And you know, one of the fun things is that we are, we're at the, the time of the Olympics. I mentioned it this morning. And if you ever look at the Olympics, one of the things that really amazes me is that you get all these people, particularly like the runners who go there, and they're maybe a tenth of a second apart. And a tenth of the second means that you win a medal or you don't win a medal or you swim and you, you're just a hair off. You ever see how they touch the wall and how, how he got his seven or eight medals last time we were there? It was a fraction of an inch between being successful and not being successful. And, and we look at that and we, and we start imagining how, how close people can get to that kind of thing. 
And if you watch the news or any of the Olympic preparation, I always find it fun to see how they pre prepare for themselves. And this morning, they were all, a bunch of them were walking around Hyde Park. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to London, but there's a big park in downtown London, Hyde Park and Green Park. And they were out, they were out watching um, the ducks go out on the, on the pond, just out there wandering and, and I'm sure in their head trying to figure out what are they going to be doing and how they're going to handle this thing. But in the corner of Hyde Park, in the corner of London, there is a place called Speaker's Corner. And if you go to Speaker's Corner, the rule was that you could say anything you wanted to about the crown, the king, or anyone else, and you wouldn't get in trouble as long as you said it on that particular corner. And it was sort of an interesting way to let the people talk without really letting them talk very much. Uh, and sometimes I felt like going through the, the history of this program that uh, when we first started it, it, it went from being this very big program, um, at least for those companies that were involved, it was meant to spur a, a lot of, uh, a lot of interesty, interest, which I think it did. And we were fortunate enough at that time to go through and become uh, go through the ranks and get down selected to the final three of that particular competition. And we didn't win. Uh, it went to a second, uh, another company. And I remember vividly that day when I got that phone call and I realized that how close we came to that particular trophy. And in that case, it was a $240 million award for a fairly small company. It was a, a big, big thing, a big game changing thing. And I, uh, we, we came to the conclusion that there were a couple of things. First, we felt we should have won, obviously. Uh, but it was a very interesting time for me because you, you go and you realize that everything you had worked for all of a sudden went out the window. And we just didn't, we didn't know whether or not we were going to ever get a chance. Um, it seemed pretty bleak at the time. Um, we felt that there was a, a lot of concern with the program. The, the company that we had lost out to had, a, had some issues that we thought were really serious. And a lot of people came to me and said, you know, you should try to do something about this. You maybe, maybe you should protest it. Maybe you should go forward because it was a, uh, there, was some, there was some controversy there. And we decided not to. And we decided to do two things. One was to take a step back and, and realize that what was most important was that this whole program, this idea of being able to change space was going to be more, far more important. And if we really tried to, to get involved and, and, um, and hurt it somehow by, by bringing it to court and extending it out, that it might kill the whole effort behind it. And we decided not to do that. Then I went off and I um, bought a punching bag. And, <laughs> and I spent the next six months hitting it really hard. And I, uh, and I realized, you know, this is one of, somebody came to me and, and gave me this quote, which I've carried with me for a while, and if life is about making mistakes, you can't make decisions without making mistakes. Just don't try to make the same ones again, but keep making them, because that's what really makes life different. And I say that to the people that work for me, I want you to go out and try. You have to push the envelope. Sometimes you have to take a really big risk. Sometimes you have to make it, take a chance and fall flat on your face. And we fell on our face. We, we had a dream that had died. And we decided, um, after some time of uh, hitting that bag for about three months, my hands were sort of swollen, that we weren't going to give it up, that uh, we were going to take a quiet step in the background. We took um, four people, literally four people, um, which at the time was 10% of my workforce, uh, and put them in a room and said, we want to keep doing this quietly in the background. And we want to become a positive influence if we can and keep working it. And that uh, that continued for several years. We worked on our own money. We, uh, we uh, began looking at how we could work together with NASA and we began, in our view, was one of the first non-funded Space Act agreements. Uh, we went to NASA and said, we'd like to work with you, but you don't have to pay us. And at the time, the folks at NASA were, were well, how does that work? And we, uh, it was a little bit of a challenge. We, we want to have oversight. We want to have milestones. We want to work with you. We want to have interaction. Um, and we want to have the discipline of doing that, but we don't want any money. And uh, it, to, to NASA's credit, it was, it's something that they embraced. And it was a terrific move for us and I think a really good thing for NASA at the same time because we began having access to understanding how NASA worked. And for two years, we worked on our own money, but we got some assistance, we got some guidance, we got some really smart, so, some really smart people giving us some direction, and it worked really, really well. And I, and I say this, and I believe this, nothing positive ever gets done by a pessimist. So we kept working very quietly in the background. The program, um, the company that won the other award went out of business six months after they started, and uh, that award then was recompeted uh, for a second time in that competition. And we, 
as the number three, as the runner-up in the beauty contest, if you will, we thought we had a pretty good shot at doing it, and we went in, and once it got going, it um, became clear that what NASA was looking for in the second round wasn't exactly the same thing as it was in the first round, and what they were really looking for was a, a cargo delivery service to the space station. So we'd spent a lot of money in our second round, and the second round came up, and um, we we were not the best vehicle. Admittedly, it was not the, we were not the best vehicle for a one-way cargo delivery service because we had a vehicle that returned and landed, and it was just not the right thing to do. So for the second time, we lost the competition. And um, at this point in time, uh, even my mother was wondering if I should have a new career choice. <laughs> and she was probably right. Uh, but we, uh, we sort of continued on in the background, and we kept working and working. And then um, the change of administration came and a refocus came and this whole idea of commercial crew started. And we began realizing that our vehicle was, in our mind, a pretty good thing for crew delivery and critical cargo delivery. So we entered in the first phase of the commercial crew contract and, and we did win that. That was about four and a half years later and some fairly debilitating losses and a lot of people from a lot of places saying, you know, you've had your shot, go try something else. You've got a good other business growing in many other places. And we... Uh, we looked at it and we said, no, we, we're going to keep going. And this, um, this is part of the Jefferson Memorial, if you ever go to D.C. It's, it's an interesting uh, slogan. It actually goes back to Shakespeare, what's past is prologue. What, what's happened is going to help you feel what's, what's going to happen in the future. And our whole program is based on that. Uh, I, I like showing the history because I'm proud of it. We, we are using a vehicle that's had a long history, going back to the Russians, something called the Bor 4. NASA spent 10 years working on this program. And we've picked it up and made it better over the course of the year. In our case, what, what is past is prologue. We've learned a tremendous amount from the program, from working with NASA, from understanding the history, from going all the way back to the Russians and figuring out how this works. And our view was to take that history and build a strong team. Um, my favorite picture that I use a lot these days, and we, we have, I think, one of the best teams in the industry that was built piece by piece, piece by mail by piece mail. Jeff Patton mentioned earlier this morning that uh, we were the first agreement that was signed by ULA, and you can imagine at the time I didn't have a program, I didn't have money, and I didn't have much of a company, but I went up to ULA and said, we want to be the first commercial agreement that you guys have. And Mike Gass at the time looked at me and he said, who are you? <laughs> and why are you here? I said, Mike, you have to have some vision here. Someday the, there's going to be a whole program around this that we're going to be able to use your rocket and, and uh, help continue to, to make it move forward. And he said, who are you? <laughs> Why are you here? But somehow in the middle of that, I, I think it was because they were so busy doing the merger between Lockheed and Boeing, we actually got a, um, an agreement signed that said we're going to go work together. And it's been a terrific partnership for us for the last five, almost five and a half years. But I, you know, don't forget these moments. And, I, and I'm telling you these stories because I think there's a lot of people in this industry right now wondering what they want to do. And is this a good industry to be in? Can you take a risk? Can you take a chance? We didn't start with a lot of money. We didn't start with a lot of uh, backing. backing. We, we've been bootstrapping it up ever since from the very beginning on this program. We're very fortunate now to have, I think, a terrific team of people. We have now over 12 companies, industrial companies, including ULA. We have now eight NASA centers. We have four universities. And one of the things I learned in my career uh, very quickly is how uh, dumb I really am. And dumb, dumb doesn't mean bad, because sometimes dumb can mean you, you don't believe everyone else on the outside who tells you you can't do something. Sometimes it means that you have to realize that there are people far smarter than you in the world. Uh, about half of our program is with teammates and partners, and I like it that way, because there are a lot of things we don't do well that we can't do well, and you've got to be honest about that. The, the biggest thing I think get, gets people tr in trouble is that they're just not honest about what they are good at and what they're not good at. So we, uh, we feel like we are continuing a legacy, and, I, and uh, I, I look at this as sort of big brother, little brother in some ways, and I, and I like that feeling. But more importantly, people looked at the end of the shuttle program and said, it's, it's terrible, it's over. And maybe it could have kept flying. That's, a, that's a, a decision that was far greater than I am. But I do contend that the program has ended. I think it was a marvelous a marvelous program for the United States. We have built, not only built the space station, but did things like fix the Hubble telescope, which to me is one of the most amazing scientific, human, and mechanical uh, combinations of things that have ever happened. Uh, we've got 80% of our images have come as a result of the shuttle being fixed. And we've learned so much. You just have to go to an IMAX movie and see the amazing pictures that have come out of that. 
And that's because some humans took a really big chance. We had a vehicle that could go out and fix it. We had people who had the courage to make that decision. And we had the people who said, OK, I made a mistake. I need to fix this mistake. And we, we feel that we're just continuing that legacy as we move forward. Um, where are we now? Uh, I, uh, I have this saying, uh, it's been, it was used to be up on my wall, it's moved, but I keep it in my heart. And I think this is sort of my four line saying of where the whole commercial effort has gone. First they looked at it and we were ignored for the most part. And then, for the mo then we moved into a period where people laughed and said we can never do it, we'll never have a chance. And then for the last few years we've been fighting a pretty strong battle, congressional, elsewhere, and, uh, and, and that, by, that fight has, uh, has really gone on for quite a long time. And now I think not necessarily my winning because I don't know if we will or not, but I think the, the program and I think the country has won as a result of this, and we are better. I, uh, I don't know how many of you people have traveled to Russia, but I have, and one of the things that really annoys me is picking up a Russian newspaper and look and see that they're advertising for space people. They want to hire people in Russia to build more rockets because they think they're going to need them because the U.S. isn't going to do that. And my view is that those jobs ought to be back here. And I am working really hard, and I know a lot of other people who are doing the same thing. So I'm going to end with, uh, anybody here know Marshall Mathers, the 21st century philosopher, poet, and writer? Uh, he does go by another name, but uh, this is a song that I used when I was punching that punching bag. And, uh, and I think it says a lot for who we are, what we are, and what we want to do. And, you know, if you had one opportunity to seize everything you ever wanted in one moment, would you just let it go or would you pick it up and, and make it work? You only get one shot, and Look. sometimes you don't even get that one shot. If We've got can. that shot, not just my company, but our one industry. Shot. And I think this is our time one to step up and take it. So thank you very much. So Ryan, how's it feel to boss me? <laughs> <laughs> he told me I, I ended early, so I guess I can take a few questions. So if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Good. Did you? Oh, okay. Hi, my name is Kathleen Karika. Um, I work at the Emerging Commercial Space Office. And earlier you had said that you um, are an American company and you want to bring the jobs and the money back here. And I was wondering what your plan is when foreign uh, companies approach you and want to buy a Dream Tracer, and not just European companies, but what if the Chinese or the Russians or someone like that wanted to buy a flight? Yeah, it's a great question. We, we are an American company. It doesn't mean we don't work with companies outside the United States. I think that makes sense. Um, I would sell them product. I would sell them service. Think of it as Boeing airplanes. You know, we are a better country because a few people made a decision to build an airplane industry in this, in this country. And I think the amount of jobs, the amount of prestige that, that Boeing, who in my view is a terrific company, has by selling those airplanes around the world, it's a great thing for us to do that. And I, that's my model. I think we can build here and sell that service, sell the rides, sell uh, sell the fact that America is leading space again to the rest of the world and let them buy it from us. Wouldn't that be a good thing? It's a great question. Uh, uh, Riley, you weren't uh, saying that you can't ask a dumb question. <laughs> uh, but, but I'm just a journalist and uh, there are all of you uh, very bright people uh, related to the space program and one of the things I'm looking at in this new era of space development is that there seem to be uh, within NASA a unified uh, sharing of information, a collaboration, uh, a sharing of technology across uh, disciplines and so on. Uh, and for the greater good, uh, as people uh, collaborated and, and melded different disciplines uh, and multiplied their, uh, their knowledge. How's that going to take place in the private sector? How is it that you are going to collaborate with traditional uh, competitors uh, for the sake of advancing the science itself? 
Yeah, I think first, just a journalist, I, I disagree with that. I think it's a terrific field. We, we need people to understand. So thank you for coming here, first off. I, there are a lot of people who write about us who don't take the time to learn about us. And I'd like to maybe compliment you on that to start with, because that shows intelligence. You're welcome. You can stay. <laughs> Ryan, let them stay. Come back next year. Uh, the serious answer to your question is, is really what I, I can only speak for my own company. I can't speak for NASA or anyone else. But what we believe we're doing is by creating an atmosphere where we can get to space more often, more frequently, less expensive, we enable science. And that is, in my view, the difference between, let's go back to the internet. Uh, I, have, I tell the story, I have a friend who runs the iPod business. And they built the iPods long before they actually sold them to us. And it was never about the mechanics of the iPod. It was about the fact that he had to have broadband in 30% of the houses because nobody's going to take two hours to download a song. And in our case, if we can get enough ships going up, enough science uh, support going up, then we're, what we're doing, and a large part of our business plan, is supporting the science research that could take place in space. Right now, it's pretty limited. You have to go to the space station, or you have to take very short, uh, short uh, suborbital flights. So imagine a world where you can have hours or days of orbital research to look at, or the station, which is doing some amazing scientific work. Uh, NASA, in my view, doesn't get the credit it deserves for the scientific research that's going on there about our health, about our future, Alzheimer's and salmonella and other things that could make huge differences in the world. But that's only going to be enabled if there's a, if, unfortunately, if there's a boring mechanism of being able to service that quickly and service that frequently. And I think that's what I and, and the others, um, uh, Boeing and SpaceX and Blue Origin and others are thinking about is enabling that, that ability to allow science and scientists to have access in a uh, much less expensive, more frequent way. And I can't say what that's going to mean, but I got to think it's going to be pretty good. Um, let's suppose you win the, the contract and you build your vehicle and you've flown it a half a dozen times to the space station and Bigelow puts up a big module. I wanted to send seven people to that Bigelow module, leave them there for a couple weeks and bring it down. How much would I have to pay you? Yeah, well, the, the answer is I can't, uh, we don't know and, I, and we're not going to talk about pricing here, but I think the concept of what you brought up is really important. We aren't doing this. If you go back to the actual origins, someday, you know, I'm a historian and I like it. If I actually read, went back and read the first RFP for the first COTS proposal done now eight years ago. And the whole purpose of that was to stimulate the commercial space industry, not for NASA, but the whole industry for what could be done, including being able to service a Bigelow station. And I think the idea here is, the, the, the quick answer to your question, the more flights we do, the much cheaper it gets. The biggest problem in this industry right now is, is the cost of launch. With all due respect to my ULA friends, they're trying as hard as they can, but the, the far biggest cost of, for all of us is the cost of the rocket to get there. And that comes down only by which, you know, people working hard to make it more efficient, but the more flights we do drops that cost substantially. So I think right now the, the, the best answer to that question is from, from our perspective, we think we can enable it, and the goal that we all are charging for, and I know we have met, is to be able to provide the service at less than what we're paying for it right now from the Russians. And that's a benchmark which is known, 63 million or so a, a seat, and to the extent that we can do better than that, we do better for our country, and we bring those jobs, and we continue to push the industry. The more flights we do, the, the much cheaper it will get, we believe, going forward. <clears throat> Marks, from the speech, I'm guessing you've got a plan B in place if you don't get the award. Can you tell us what that uh, might look like? Uh, yeah, we have a plan B, plan C, and plan D, probably. Um, the answer is no, I can't tell you, and, and not because I don't want to. Uh, because in our belief, first, we, we are a company that's been preparing. We've grown to be a pretty big company, not because we haven't looked at contingencies. But I believe I have a space family, uh, the people who work for me, the people who are around me, the vendors, and, and when and if we decide and ha hear from the decision, if it's a great decision, we're going to tell them first. If it's a bad decision, we're going to tell them first, and we're going to talk about the future amongst our team first before we go out publicly with it. That's my obligation to my teammates and to my friends and the family and my company, and, 
And uh, we will discuss those contingencies when and if necessary. And the contingencies go on both sides because this is quite a large variety of awards that could possibly happen. And uh, this is not the time and the place to do that because I need to respect that for the people around me first. Well, thank you very much. I appreciated a chance to talk to you. <laughs>